there's so yeah. much of a push for that phrase. There are systems that need to change. And I'm trying to think critically and humbly, like mm -hmm. it's easy to see the systems in the past. And I just wonder, is there a really obvious system that is unjust towards black people that right now we could pass this law and fix it? Again, Mike Westendorf, we're here again with uh, Pastor Aaron Robinson, Pastor Mike Novotny, CL Whiteside. Uh, I'm Mike Westendorf, the host of this Mile Marker uh, video. We're continuing our conversation. This is part two. If you missed the first one, we had a lot of great conversation. Uh, please go back and check that out. It'll give you some context for what it is that we're gonna be talking a little bit about in this hour. And just to catch you up for some of you, um, we have been talking about the challenges that exist. We want to take a look again in, at, at what the gospel has to say. Where, where is Jesus in all of this? How do we take our fears and our anxieties, our angers back to Christ? And um, that's eventually where we're going to get back to. But these are hard, hard conversations. And so we're going to ask you for the time uh, to please give us to, to allow these conversations to unfold a little bit because we can't even... In, two videos or four videos solve and, and talk into all of the things that uh, many of you guys have as concerns. Um, but I, I just want to start us with this because this is where I hope that we'll end. And I, I was reading this to a group last night, and this is a prayer that Jesus had uh, for all believers. And I love that in space and in time, before he goes to the cross, Jesus has this prayer for people years from now who would come, who would call him uh, Savior and who would know the Father through him. Jesus says these words, and it's from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. My prayer is not for them alone, not the disciples only. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. And which is pretty cool that we get to be a part of sharing that message and that years from now, we get to be a part of continuing that message that goes all the way back to the apostles. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, there's that unity, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as I have loved, as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, ooh, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And this is the, this is the culture of the conversation that we would like to have as we speak into some very challenging topics. And so this, uh, this next question that we wanted to tackle a little bit is, um, how, how do we talk about... Um, you know, whether we explain or justify uh, the violence, rioting, looting, and intimidation that exists as um, this, this movement has kind of unfolded. The very real need to have, as we talked about the Black Lives Matter conversation, and to have that truth, and yet in order to make that stick in the minds of people, there are tactics that are taken. In some cases, it's, it's very clearly sinful. Um, and yet, as you had talked about in the first ta time, We've had these conversations many, many times. And we love the song, and we love the art, and we love the movies, but no real change ever came. So um, maybe let's talk a little bit about the, 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 the value or the way that um, we need to speak into that. Is that a fair question, I hope? Are you asking mm -hmm. what we think about How do we explain it? How do we explain it? How do we justify it? How do we talk about it? How do we make sense of it? Um, yeah. So I just think um, looking at it, you can identify what's wrong. You can identify sin in it. And when you are a, a Christian man or woman that's making statements about it, my question sometimes is just, do you have that same energy for everything else? Like to me, it's without a doubt wrong. I think that's the frustrating thing sometimes as a black man, like without a doubt it's wrong, but you're pointing this one out, but you didn't point that one out. 
you kind of look over that one like, oh, well, that those people did this. Or when people are bringing guns to state buildings, that's like, well, that's their right. But it's like, what? So it's just a double standard to me. But I think at the end of the day, just understanding and what I always try to remember is why are they doing this? Sometimes, a lot of times, it's the people that are hurt. Hmm. People that are hurt, so how can I love them? What, what would Jesus do in this situation? Of course, he would say that's wrong, but what, how would he show them love in this situation versus, versus just saying you're wrong and that's it? Hmm. Um, I like that approach a lot because there are two things at the same time. And if you just focus on the one, there's a soul who really needs help. Someone once told me when someone's deeply grieving, let's say a family loses a child, and they start saying things that aren't true. God doesn't love us. God's forgotten about us. I can pounce on that sin because it is sin. That's mm-hmm. false. That's a lie. <laughs> or I can ask myself, okay, why are they saying that in the depth of their grief? And I can minister to the grief. And in time, they might come to see, oh, yeah, what, what I was saying was not true. That, that wasn't, I was caught up in the moment. Uh, it's a little bit different when there's violence at stake because we don't want anyone to get robbed, hurt, kill. We don't want more injustice to compound. But, but I think we, we can't use the riding as just an excuse to say, well, that's the real problem. That, that's the fruit that came from a different root. So can I say both things at the same time without using it as a scapegoat? Yeah, I, I, I think you have to um, be real with yourself. And, and I recognize that there are racist people in the world but not all people are racist. That there are rogue cops on the force. Not all cops are rogue. That there are people who will incite violence during a protest, but not all protesters are violent. I don't live in this one, one-way world. Mm-hmm. You know, I live yeah. in the world where God says he loves me, but hates my sin. <laughs> yeah, I'm right, in, I right. live in a world full of sin and grace. So I, I, can, I can see the protest as a legitimate protest against injustice and racial injustice, uh, authoritative injustice, and still talk against the violence that might come around it or even in it and not be false. In the same way, you you know, you mentioned this earlier in the off-camera discussion. I think I can say that the police force is something that can be trusted the majority of the time. But there are some rogue cops, and they're probably more than we would like to admit at times, that have an agenda that is not favorable to people of color. So I'm not saying that the police force is bad. I'm, I'm not saying that, they're, that cops are, 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 are evil. I'm saying by us, they're sinful, and there are sinful cops in there that, that misuse their power. Hmm. So I, I could have, we're flexible enough to have both of those conversations. I don't know why we have yeah. to make it one or the other. Yeah. You know, it's... <laughs> It's not all or nothing. It's it's somewhere in that middle. Yeah. Do y'all watch the news a lot? Not anymore. I got tired of it. Uh, not much. Because to me, that's what it stems from, too. Like, most of the things on the news are going to be bad or it's going to be what's hot. Mm. They're not going to usually tell you the good stuff that's going on. They're mm. not going to tell you, oh, a black man and a white man got together and we're talking about God. That's not, <laughs> that's not newsworthy. <laughs> Breaking it's news. Gonna be, it's going to be bad stuff for the most part. So that's, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, and I'm, I'm glad you bring this up because yesterday... Um, the chief of police is a member of our church, and then we have another uh, police officer who I saw that night, and I'm thinking about their daughters and their spouses. And uh, I want to make that a legitimate issue, too, to turn an eye to people who might be in real harm's way. You know, I'm thinking if their daughters were sitting here in this half circle, would I, I change the tone or my comments? So I think there needs to be a balance, because if we really want justice, then it has to be justice for all. We can't just swing the justice from this group to another group. And, and that is not an easy task. Um, so I, I like how you said it. You, you have to come in and take sin seriously wherever it happens um, to come with grace when we can. I, there's a question, I, if you don't mind me asking. I, I, want, I was curious about what you guys thought of this. To me, the common thread in so much of this is that we protect our own. So if you have a police force and there's, and there's a bad apple cop and there's a complaint from the black community, we kind of side with our own. We'll put up with that injustice. Let's say you have a big group of black marchers and protesters and some of them turn, riot, turn riotous. Will you protect your own or will you deal with the issue? I, 
I think of what happened to the Catholic Church when they protected their own. Yeah. You know, uh, I think of what can happen in, in my mm -hmm. church if we, oh, you know, the, he's the pastor, we'll show him respect. And like, it seems to me the heart of justice is a willingness not to protect my own mm. if my own sins. And I wonder if the police force can do that, if we can do that in the church, if the black community can do that. What? There, I have seen a couple of things online where uh, black people within a neighborhood have uh, talked to the protesters to make sure that in their neighborhood they would, in that, in that moment, there wouldn't be any violence. Hmm. So there's a self-policing that's going on. Uh, if you think about the amount of violence that's happened in the protests, it's really died down considerably from the first couple of weeks where it seemed to be, you know, it, after Floyd's murder, it was, it, it seemed to be everywhere. It was, it was spark here. Protests were widespread, but then violence would spark up now and again. Hmm. I think there have been, there has been that self-policing because those within the, the marches recognize it's hurting their cause. Mm -hmm. But you, you're right. If, if there is um, a desire it is to protect own, whether it be church or, or community, um, and so I think sometimes we do that. We'll we'll give our own group a pass for comments or activities yeah. when we would we would blast another person for saying it. You know, and, and I I think about in the high school setting um, within the last ten fifteen years, uh, the uh, pejorative word for for black people has been used more often than it should be by both black and white students. You know, it's an issue at, at, at dances where they, they bleep the word out, but they all know the word, and so they say it yeah. anyway. Mm. Well, that's one of those moments where in the black community we say about our, our black brothers and sisters, well, that's our word, we can use it. Now, we've, we've, we've kicked taken care of our group. Mm. The white person says it, no, there's going to be problems. So we do that with words, we do that with, with actions, where we, within a group, there are phrases or ways that, that act that we allow, and we will try to work on within the group. <laughs> Especially from a, a, bi a biblical perspective, it's just we want to protect our brand a lot of times. You look at people want to protect their tribe or the Pharisees want to protect the Pharisees. What made Jesus unique is that he was going to call you out no matter what. Mm. But he still was going to love you, but he still was going to call you out too. Wow. So I think it's just understanding that just because someone made a mistake that they can't change from that or they can't grow from that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where all of us kind of miss points sometimes because we generalize a lot. Or one bad apple, they're all bad apples. And that's not necessarily true. Yeah. And you forget a lot of times that people actually change. People have the capability to change. God does that in our hmm. That's it, awesome. It, it, thanks for bringing the Bible back to it because uh, the Apostle Paul was that guy. But the disciples didn't trust him. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't want him in the group. Yeah. They had that Barnabas come and, and vouch for him and say he's okay. And, and it hmm. took time for them to stretch. God had changed his heart, but they didn't know it yet. And all of a sudden, you know, he, and, he becomes part of the group and he goes out and does the, the work of, 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 our, of our Lord. Oh. But it's that, that God does, the, Christ changes the hearts, right? Yeah. And as individuals, we would stick to, the disciples stuck to their group. They want Paul to get in there because oh. he was on the outside. So. That's so good. And then Peter too. I mean, it isn't until the book of Acts where Peter... What does he say in the house of Cornelius? I now realize that God doesn't show favoritism. Like, wait, Took that this is now? now? This isn't day one with Jesus. Like, you, you were there start to finish, resurrection, saw him preaching, Pentecost. And it isn't until after being filled with the Holy Spirit, until Acts 10, that the race switch flips in Peter's head. And God and, had to be ultra specific about it to get him to move. Yeah. You know? He, just, he had to force it. So yeah. you think about, I love the examples of like the patience of God. God can and does change people. He's patient in our messiness. And maybe we could see more change if we could imitate that patience with each other. And, and, and I know you say it's not a Bible study, but going back to <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we wanted more Bible. Okay. Everybody on the, on the camera the Bible wanted more Bible. Bible. So you go sure. with it. That's and what then, I wanted. Even after the Cornelius moment, moment Peter mm -hmm. had to be yeah. addressed by Paul for still going back. Yeah. Because because you're, you're so used to how you're raised yep. of what your 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 mom and dad did and said and the community you're in. So even though you may have a moment of of, of awakening to that, that Black Lives Matter, as well as all other lives are, are are paid for by Christ, and so you you have that moment of clarity. You still might go back to your tribe when things get tight. Mm. When, 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 yeah. And and he's the guy who will then later on <laughs> write. 
The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled. This is Peter writing <laughs> about Peter. Self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply. You've talked about it because love covers over a multitude of sins. And I'm just thinking Peter's just thinking about you know, himself, his own, his own deal. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms so that God would get the glory. Just Same guy. Same guy. <laughs> That's why he knows the Holy Spirit, right? Because <laughs> yeah. Peter Maxted wouldn't have got that. Holy Spirit said, write this down. You need to write this down for yourself and for the world because they need to know this. Right. The Holy Spirit is awesome. Right. Yeah, you That's need so to true. have that story. I, I, before we run, we, we go to the next, the next pace of, space of things, I just... I wanted to comment because this, could, this hit closer to home, and I, I sent it to you guys too, that um, as we ran in, as our, our family dealt with the immediate effects of, of a significant protest, that was just you know one of those things that just kind of came out of nowhere and boom, shut mm-hmm. things down, um, that, that, that people do have to understand that there's the intimidation reality is very, it, it does cause emotional uh, stress and distress because you, yeah. you just don't know the lie the, the spaces so a peaceful protest still does have uh, some damaging impacts to people but my you know I was talking to another friend who who also said um, and this is kind of going back t- to your thing I'll just give two thoughts that I know a little bit more about maybe what it feels like to you know th- this is you know my daughter in a workplace and it gets overwhelmed by this thing. And um, what would that feel like if I came from the black community? I don't know that. But it, it, it lets me have a little bit of a glimpse of empathy. And so God has kind of given me a season to be able to think, okay, is there some value? If God works all things, and I don't know if this is tempting God, I don't know, so you guys can correct me on this, but if God works all things, you know, to my good and his glory, is there something even in this moment that's breaking relationships that God needs me to see that's true of him. And so can there be value from the protesting side um, that I've never heard before? I would say that it has gotten my attention and it has helped me listen a bit better. But there has been some value that at least I can see God working in my heart to say, Mike, and this is what it feels like. Maybe you can have a conversation. Yeah, the, um, one of the problems... I've mentioned before is with, with a, how we look at the history of our country, history in general. And, and I think when people talk about the history of America and having the right to peacefully assemble and, and protest, that throughout our history, Americans haven't peacefully done that. That, that, there's, that with most protests, there's been some element of destruction of something. And I, the, the, the one we learned about early on is not even an American, right? Because they're still colonies. But it's the, the Boston Tea Party. Mm. We learned about that one. Was that peaceful? I don't think it was. It's, so, so this is an, it's not a new thing. It's, it's not a black thing. You know, um, there are people that, that, that did things to other communities that weren't their own that was, was, was worse than what we've had thus far. That being said, um, you asked about the protests, anything positive coming from it, and the answer is yes. People who weren't listening prior to this moment are listening. Hopefully they're not just hearing, but they're actually listening. Yeah. Big distinction there. Big dis- yeah. That's a big distinction. Yeah, hearing so Because listening. everybody's hearing it, right? But, but to actually listen and take the time to then do some research, to follow up, maybe to engage in a conversation with somebody that, that's not like you, that maybe was raised differently than you were, um, somebody that, 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 whose heart is bleeding right now, to, to listen, that, that's all positive from it. Now, what I hope happens is that there comes from within a black community a, a leadership that, that we can get behind that doesn't have an agenda that is anti-scriptural. Right. That there's leadership within the white community that, that, that doesn't try to stump it down because it doesn't help with the, a different agenda. That, that we have leaders grow out of this that we can point to and say, okay, um, we want to support them now and, and not the violence, but what was said that was good and right in the protest. And I don't, if, if, if you're out there, future leaders of America, you know, we're looking for you now. 
Because the ones that were have, that have been leading, white, black, left, right, I, I have very little confidence in. And I think that's where the, 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 the loudness, the, the, um, the level of volume of the protesters is at now. They don't trust the leaders. Yeah. Um, I was going to say one thing to add to that, too. I think it gives you a unique opportunity to love because all of a sudden your comfort is on the line and it has your attention. So what are you going to do with this? Because sometimes there is anger. Sometimes it's like just confusion. Like, why in the world is this? What what is happening? And it makes you it can make you and hopefully it will make you reevaluate yourself and say, how can I love or how can I help in this situation? So what what do you it makes you think about it at the very least? At least I can say that it has made you do that, I should say. Mm -hmm. So, one of the, the first portions of scripture that we had to choose from or able to choose from at Sim was Jesus called him in the storm. And, and it, we all applied it, probably misapplied it sometimes. <laughs> we put everything. But I want to focus in on the disciples' fear. The disciples being afraid of what might happen in that boat as the storm was right there. And they did everything they could, right? They were bailing out water. They were fishermen. They kind of tried to do what they could. And they, they could do it. And they went to Jesus in, 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 a, in a wrong way, I would say. Don't you care about us? <laughs> right? <laughs> right. But, but, but at least they went to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> they, they went to God. And, and they, they didn't necessarily understand how he would do it. They didn't know he was going to say, say, be quiet and calm the storm. But they, they went to him. So right now, we're in a situation where we don't know how this will end up. We don't know how it will play out. We don't know how God will use this to bless those who love him and call to his purpose. We don't know right, that, right? Right, right. But if we go to him, sometimes it might be in a wrong way. Yeah. Lord, don't you care about us right now? But we go to him and let him answer us. And, and, and that's the example that then Jesus shows us in the garden, right? When he says, the Father, not my will, but your will, he goes to him in, in, in a moment of question and, and asking and he is about to face the cross for all of us, and he goes to the Father. So, mm. in this moment with fear, go to God. Go to him and, and, and ask him to, to take away the fear, to, to give you a better path than the, than the fear, and where that might lead you, but all according to his will. And then, once again, back to the talk from earlier, be patient, because God doesn't always do what we want Right where we want it. Hmm. It may take time. He summed that up very well. Can you get an amen? I'll, I'll, I'll get an amen. amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to respect time. And um, uh, so there's one more, uh, I think, core question that, that we wanted to, to jump into. You guys don't want to tackle this one if we see. There was one more tough one. And, um, and this does, this was one of the, the things that, that we, again, heard from a lot of people. And, and just the struggle uh, when it comes to words like systemic racism and white privilege. These are two things that are, are um, a big part of what's called critical theory. I'm no expert in this. Again, I, I'm learning about some of these pieces uh, for the first time, too. Stuff that other people have been talking about for a while, you know, and they're going, like, oh, duh. Um, but, but I had asked, uh, how many different, so when we see the English translation of love in the Bible, how many different meanings does it have in the Greek? It's like four, four. you know? And, in a, and some people talk about, in like in Shakespeare's day, they had like a vocabulary of 13,000, and you know, today uh, people have about 6,000 words or something like that. So we have a word problem that you can't, you know, a, a word has, um, actually it can have multiple meanings, but we all distill it into the worst possible one from my per particular point of view. And so white privilege, systemic racism are two things that have been thrown out. It's been thrown out from an academic thought process that's, just, that's pretty anti-Christian. Um, and yet there's also, as we talked about, and I think demonstrated very clearly, that there is this reality of, um, uh, from a perspective, and you, did, you guys did a great job of that last time, and Janai in particular's comments was just great with the wind at your back. There, there's just, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, it's just acknowledge it. It's not a, we're not gonna crucify you because you had a little bit of an easier time so there's, there's, there's this idea of privilege that kind of comes in different ways, and yet there's, there's this, the, the, the two, systemic racism, white privilege, many people just don't believe that they exist, and yet there's incredible tension. We felt it in our last conversation, 
And uh, we just wanted to be able to revi- revisit just how do we as Christians view this, th- this tension? What do we, again, how do we go back to the Bible uh, to understand? Did you feel tension? Last time? Yeah. I didn't. I, I didn't. In our conversation, I didn't at all. I think white people feel, feel more attention than black people usually about conversations about race. Usually that's generalizing. So, so I, I was thinking about that question because you sent it out to us earlier and about systemic racism and white privilege. Um, as, a, as a Christian community, uh, our church body believes in original sin. We acknowledge that that is a fact that God has stated in the Bible, that David references to the Spirit's power in the Psalms, that, that, that we have been sinful from birth. That's original sin. We, we can't, don't deny that. That doesn't discount the sin I committed yesterday. Systematic racism doesn't, isn't, isn't discounting any progress forward or any racism that happens in the moment. So, so I look for our church body, I'll say it's systemic sin. That it was there, planted somewhere in us from the time we were conceived. We call it original sin. Uh, they call it America racism or the black white co- uh, conflict America's original sin. And they're not even Christian. They, they don't understand how deep that could actually go. Talking about the thing that, that still makes us struggle even now, as we have had so much growth, and we have, and there's so much opportunity that's there, but that original sin, that systemic sin, that, that racism that, that caused people to treat others like chattel and to not give them full representation even after they were free, and then all the other things you talked about, you mentioned earlier, the redlining, and all those things happened. If, if a person can't see that racism, and they want to call it something different, fine. I, I, don't, care. I, don't, want to, I don't want to argue over words. Right. Systemic, um, institutional, you, you call it what you want to call it. I know they mean different things, different people. But just to acknowledge the, the racism that has been in our country since the first slave ship entered, maybe even before that, if you want to go to the Native Americans, now they were treated by the, by the, the, by the settlers. So, so that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I don't need to, to squabble over words. I mean, it'd be nice to define them. A friend of mine was arguing with me for three hours one night <laughs> um, about defining terms. And I get his point, but, but we're, not, we're never going to agree on the term because we didn't create the term. It was given to us by somebody who st- studied a bunch, and they said, this is systemic racism, and I can understand what they mean, mm-hmm. even if I wouldn't use that same term to describe it. Mm-hmm. And the same thing with the white privilege. And so yeah. defining terms or just accepting the, the reality of what the terms mean mm-hmm. is more important than us, you know, being able to say what it is on an ACT test. <laughs> yeah. So do you think there are, I heard you reference a bunch of like books and documentaries on the last video. And I wanted to, to ask you a question. Do you think there are systems right now that are unjust and racist or... Do you think that there were systems in America's past that just led to this disparity between, talk about incarceration rates or being punished for crimes? Ooh. You know, if, you, if yeah. you wanted to say to me, here's the system right now that is unjust and unfair towards black people, um, what would that system be? Well, I mean, history definitely played a part. For sure. I just think about like incarceration and like the red line. And yeah. that's still like, I think the Bible talks about sins of the third and fourth generation. Mm-hmm. We're still paying for some of those things. There are consequences to those things that still have not been made right. Yes. So I think that it's, it's both, but I mean, it does come from, from history. And, and that's what I wondered. There's so yeah. much of a push for that phrase. There are systems that need to change. And I'm trying to think critically and humbly, like mm-hmm. it's easy to see the systems in the past. And I just wonder, is there a really obvious system that is unjust towards black people, that right now we could pass this law and fix it. And I, I, right I don't now. know what it is after all my reading, but I'm pretty ignorant to a lot of things. I wouldn't say a law, but I, I would say our education system is, is, is slanted in two ways. It's slanted uh, culturally um, because it speaks to the, the majority culture more than it has over time. But you think it's something that we could change right now, specifically in there, that would change it? Because that was the question, right? Yeah. Like if, was, if you're saying, let's, let's end systemic racism. Okay. And I get to cast the vote, make the decision. I'm the yeah. chief of police. I'm the school superintendent. I, I have the power to change the system. Okay. What, what do I change? Okay, so you, I, I don't want to take on this task, so please don't ask me to do this. <laughs> but you start rewriting history books 
not rewriting history. You just present history in a factual way context. for all, all, for all, context. all Americans. So we learn the history of all Americans equally, even though I know there's a majority culture percentage wise in it. And so in some things you don't do it that way because of percentages, mm -hmm. but that's what hurts the, the majority culture understand the, the minority cultures and vice versa. Because, because you grew up, I grew up looking at the white culture and, and it was the culture to be, not mm -hmm. my culture. And so then you end up you end up growing up with a negative view of your own culture, even though you may not live that out in your day to day. Mm -hmm. You have that. So I would say education is one, and it was it, and it's also for middle class and up. Edu so I heard this uh, just last year on a, on a on a talk. Someone was saying that if you don't have a parent at home who helps the child with their homework, then it goes home. So both parents are working. How's a child going to help with their math or their science or reading at home? They don't. But if you have a, a, a wealthier family, a parent where, where one, they can, they can, one can stay at home at a certain time, they can trade off whatever else, a two-parent household, mm -hmm. now that child has a support group at home that's able to help them with. So the, the poor families, you have to either work more hours mm -hmm. or you don't even have the education yourself. The education system isn't geared toward them. So in a couple of ways, it's, it's slanted. Yeah. There's, a, there's a cultural issue, yep. then there's an economic issue with regard to education that I think they're, they're addressing the ed economic issue a little more these days. That's where choice comes in, right? The choice uh, program in Wisconsin, that's where uh, schools are seeing less homework and doing more in, in class. They are addressing the economic yeah. um, slant. And but, I, I think that's where it gets tricky is there's just such complexity. Like, I, yes. yes, I want to end systemic racism. And I'll... <laughs> Who gets to write the history book and what economic <laughs> bill should I pass? And yeah. like, I, I, you know, I want to march and say, let's end this. But if you give me a blank sheet of paper, like yeah. how I would change economics to undo and how long would that years even of history. Take? How long would that take? Even like, would that take a few generations? Would that take five generations? Like, mm. yeah, it's complex. I, so my wife and I took a little anniversary trip down to Milwaukee and Madison, maybe two weeks weekends ago, and all of State Street in Madison was boarded up from the Capitol all the way down to the Union. Mm -hmm. And it was actually beautiful because on every piece of plywood, artists had come in and left messages. And my favorite one was really simple. It was mostly just the kind of spotted brown plywood. And it had a, a heart and then a house and then a globe. And the message says, if it doesn't start here, the heart, and then get here into the home, it will never change here to the globe. And it just made me think, as much as we would all love to flip the switch on every kind of sin, including yes. injustice, like, I'm sure it's easy for me to say, like, trees grow slowly, and to undo 400 years of racism in America, yep. it, it's gonna take more than another protest. It, it might take a lot of parents like me now raising my kids, reading books by black authors. Homes changing one by one, because we're listening now, because mm -hmm. we're finally listening. And that in a generation could, could it, I mean, you were even saying about your students, white and black, they get it. Yeah. I'm like, huh, I didn't get it when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So what has changed culturally? And it's gotta be agonizing when you watch the George Floyd video and say, how can you be patient when this is still happening? Mm -hmm. But man, God give us patience for that tension, because I. I don't think there's any other way. Yeah. yeah. It seems like this is, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, this is part of every generation's fight. I mean, I, I can remember talking with a pastor that um, we were talking about different, basically philosophies of ministry and how do we share the gospel and stuff. And um, he just reminded me that every, every generation has to wrestle with the truths of scripture and, and basically ask, do I believe this? You know, do, how do I apply that? Every generation has to take ownership of that reality. And I, and I really appreciate what you said about history. I'm a, I'm a big history guy. You know, that, remember in the Wisco days, I forget his, his name, but I can still picture his, his very old face because he was old and wise and he was teaching history. So if you could get him talking about stories, you knew that you were going to get off the whole period because it was great. But he was, he was the guy who they would say, um, uh, those who do not learn from history are... 
doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And so not rewriting history, but to give the context of the history, the full context, the full story of the history, particularly now, and that every generation has to take some level of ownership of that um, and, yeah. and, and understand it. And again, if you do it with the BLM organization, you're going to come to a humanistic, socialist, different outcome. But if you take that same thing about what we're talking about and you apply it to the way that Jesus said, this is how I want you to view yourselves in light of what I've done for you. This is then how I want you to view and act toward other people. That's the kind of outcome that, that you kind of hope that people say, I don't know what those Christians got going on there, but that's, that seems to be authentic and genuine. And that seems to be a part, I want to be a part of that. I think about that a lot when Jesus said, I, I want you guys to love each other the way that I loved you because it's by the way that you guys love each other that the world's going to know my love. Mm. This has been, again, just exceptionally helpful. Um, I can't talk about everything and we can't speak into every perspective, but to be able to share this in God's word uh, with one another and with, with our audience. Again, thank you for listening. I, I, as we close, I would like to ask... Um, Maybe what's one, what's one thought that you, you know, something that you've learned through this process, and a lot of people are asking, what do we do? Not what do white people do, or what do black people do, but what do we, I think we as, what, what can we as Christians do uh, to offer um, perspective and, and God's grace into the world? So I'm kind of curious, what's something that you've learned uh, or something that, that you're, you're taking home that is changing how you will live out that, that Christian life. So can I start with, with yeah. uh, jumping you? First? I think all of us at times receive feedback. And when we get that feedback, sometimes we love it because it's really, really good. And sometimes we don't necessarily love it because it might seem like it's attacking us. Especially that feedback that seems like it's attacking us or we need to defend ourselves. I think that's the feedback we most likely need to sit down and examine ourselves and just find like, man, am I, am I possibly doing this? Because at the end of the day, when you want to love someone, it, ha it takes change. And sometimes it just takes examining yourself and asking that why. So I think not becoming defensive and going on a strike when you hear feedback that you don't like, but actually just taking a step back, allowing your anger to come down or allow your emotions to, to get back to this equilibrium and just thinking about, all right, what, what are they really saying? How can I love them? What would Jesus do in this moment? Yeah, that's great. I think about uh, people ask, what can we do? Uh, it's, it's not a new question. Uh, the soldiers uh, at, the, at the Bank of the Jordan, the tax collectors at the Bank of the Jordan, uh, the Pharisees, they asked, they asked John the Baptist, what should we do now that, that we know the truth, that we know that, that we need to repent and be baptized and, and for the forgiveness of sins, what do we do? And, and he told them each how to to live lovingly. And so it's, it shouldn't be that hard, but ask the, the Lord uh, who owns your heart. It's just, okay, Lord, how, would, how do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And, and he will direct your ways. If you're in his word, if you're, if you're, you're, you're studying it, if you're de devoting over, if you're meditating in it, you're, whatever, just be in the word and let him guide you. Then he'll, he'll, he'll tell you, don't take too much money if you're a tax collector. Don't be abusive if you're a soldier. Don't be, you know, and, and he'll guide us to love because that, that's, that's who he is. He's God of love. So my, my advice is to be in the word and that God guides you. Hmm. Top that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Ditto. <laughs> my God. I'm thinking of a, a show I saw on Netflix a couple years ago. I think it was called The Sacrifice. Either any of you guys watch it? I haven't seen that one. No, it was like a social experiment where they set this guy up, he was kind of, uh, not kind of, he was racist, very prejudiced against uh, Mexican immigrants. And they wanted to see, they set up a whole storyline. It was pretty controversial because he, he didn't know what was happening. They wanted to see if by the end of the show, they could get him to take a bullet for an illegal immigrant. And so they had this whole storyline with like bikers and everything. Um, you, could, you, can, don't, don't, don't you, can try to you can try to track on the show. But one of the things they had him do was, uh, I forget the background of the psychology experiment, they had him sit in a room for maybe 10 or 30 minutes just with a Hispanic guy, no words, and he just had to look at him. And that was the moment the guy broke. He, 
He couldn't look at a man that he has been, had been raised to be prejudiced against. Just sit in a room, no words, no lecture, no sermon. Just look another human being in the eye for 30 minutes. And it, you could just see him melting. And like, can I give you a hug? And he ends up, well, I won't spoil the show. Now you're going to want to watch it. You're welcome, Netflix. <laughs> and I, I just think of that. There's, we get caught up in our little social media echo chambers. And what, what happens when you just sit with someone and look them in the eye? Or even better, pray together, talk about Jesus. All the things your culture, your history books, even your own parents and grandparents taught you just melt away in that moment. And the Holy Spirit convicts your heart and brings you back to unity. So, however we can create those conversations like this, I thank you guys for taking the time and helping guys like us learn. Um, mm -hmm. Starts here, goes to the home. God, let it change the world. Yeah. I was thinking it starts with me. You and I talked a little bit about that. Um, that uh, when, we, when we think about the issues of our day, they, they're so overwhelming. You know, do I have to run for president before I can, I can go and make a change? Do I have to be a pastor before I can make a change? Do I have to be a professional Christian before I can make a change? No, it's just one person in the Word being reminded of the love that God has for us in Christ, that he's called me a son and a daughter that he's, he's looked at the ugliest things that I can think or say or do, and he said, I see you, I heard you, and I forgive you. And, and that from that place, um, to then be able to just understand, I mean, we're only capable of X number of actual relationships mm. that really matter, that actually influence other people. And so you start there, and if we're fortunate enough to, to be married or have a family, then it, then it starts in my home my family church, that, 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 that the body of Christ really begins there and then it moves into maybe my extended family or my, my, my half of the neighborhood, not even my whole block, <laughs> just, just my little side of the alley, you know, to, to, to love and to listen. And see, I think one of the things I've taken uh, away from you is to just, in every action, um, I like what you had said, you know, leave, leave space for patience and leave space for somebody's anger um, to ask why. Um, and to really be able to, to, to calm myself, to just step back and to say, but why? Um, because if I don't ever ask that, if I'm never curious about that other person, I'll just never get there. And that change, I, I don't, I, why, Lord? Isn't that what everybody's asking? Even the yeah. psalmist, over and over, why? Psalm 42, why so are you downcast inside me? You're, put your hope in Christ. So I, I, I'm thinking again, just as an encouragement for all of us who would like to do something, for all of you who are at home, wanting to do something, that it, it starts with Jesus, and then it starts with me, and the few people we talked platform last time, the platform that God's given me for that day, and to be constantly in the Word so that I hear this more than any other outside social media echo chamber, news report, whatever, that I know my Father's voice so that it can be clear. Um, I was wondering if uh, you guys want to flip four or do a handshake for who can pray us out right here. <laughs> you go ahead. Okay. I was going to ring the back of it. <laughs> See, I didn't know if you wanted to do the handshake. <laughs> I thought you was too. I'm just sitting here like, like, nope. <laughs> we need to practice oh, on this. That was tough work. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let me let me train try this again. Hey, uh, Pastor Mike, would you pray? I would love to. <laughs> I would love to pray. Holy cow! Um, dear God, uh, I have more in common with uh, two of the men in this prayer than with billions of people on this planet who share my skin color. Uh, because through Jesus, uh, we have something immensely greater than ethnicity or history. Uh, we have e eternity because of you. Uh, I'm so grateful that I'm going to be worshiping with uh, these brothers and so many other brothers and sisters from every tribe and language and people and tongue and nation. Uh, we can't wait, like Revelation 19 says, for you to come and judge with justice. It breaks our hearts to see acts of injustice so vividly caught on camera. God, you've been seeing stuff like that for all of human history and, and you know that there is a day when your son will return to judge the living and the dead, and it will be pure goodness and righteousness and truth. Uh, we ache and long for that day. But we also know that there are people that we personally know who don't know Jesus. 
and that you allow this broken world to keep on going, injustice included, because you care so much, not just about life here on earth, but life forever with you in heaven. And so give us the patience we need, Father. Uh, give us the humility that we've been talking about, that we could love each other, listen to each other, and learn from each other. Um, our sinful nature is going to be stubborn and it's, it's not going to go there without a fight. So God, break it, conquer it, triumph over it, and remind us that we have the Holy Spirit. The, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. So do God great things, Heavenly Father, through us uh, and for us and with us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 On a journey, mile markers show your progress toward a destination. New places to see, new people to meet. And yet, adulting? It's exciting and it's hard. New experiences. New fears to conquer. New questions that need answers. None of us get to the destination on our own. When that destination feels a thousand miles away, you're not on that road alone. 